All right. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today for today's virtual event live from the studio with Molly Burke. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Griffin Art Projects is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Stolo nations. Now we are very honored and grateful to undertake our work here. My name is Nathaniel Marchand, and I'm the virtual programs coordinator here at Griffin Art Projects. I'd like to share a few quick housekeeping notes uh, before we jump into today's presentation. So firstly, I would like to mention that if you would like to see live captions displayed for today's presentations, you can enable this by selecting the CC Live transcription button at the bottom of your screen. And I'd also like to mention that if you are experiencing any technical issues with the Zoom interface, we are also streaming today's event live on Griffin Art Project's Facebook page, which you see the link for there. And lastly, I would like to mention um, that we are using the Zoom's webinar format today, which means that we can't see or hear you, but that if you would like to get in touch, you can use the chat dialog box at the bottom of your screen. And also there will be a audience Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. So if you do have any questions, you can feel free to type them into the Q&A dialog box, which you'll notice is separate from the chat box. Uh, just keeps things a little more orderly. If you type them into the chat, it might get a little lost, but we'll try and keep track either way. Um, also, if you would like to ask your question aloud, you can either raise a virtual hand, which you'll see also on that um, toolbar, or you can just indicate such in your question, and I can uh, permit you to unmute yourself to ask your question. Um, just be aware that we are recording today's presentation, so your voice will be recorded. So without further ado, do, um, I'd like to introduce today's presentation. Um, it will feature Griffin Art Project's current artist in residence, Molly Burke who is the 2021 recipient of Griffin's annual Emily Carr University Studio Residency Award. This residency recognizes the achievements of a distinguished student from the MFA program at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. This residency period spans from October 1st until the end of November, so Molly's about midway through. Molly Burke is a multidisciplinary artist considering the relationship between computation and social abstraction. She lives and works in Vancouver on unceded Coast Salish territory. She holds a BA from McGill University in Art History and Cultural Studies, a Diploma of Fine Arts from Langara, and a Master's of Fine Arts from Emily Carr University of Art and Design. She was awarded the Bill Watson Award for Excellence in Printmaking, the Barbara Arn Varnschwal Scholarship for Outstanding Contribution to the, art, to the Visual Arts, and the SSHRC Graduate Scholarship for her research in mediation. She is a 2001 artist in resident at the Material Matters Research Lab, was recently shortlisted for the 2021 Lynn Prize and is shown in various places across Canada. So thanks so much for joining us today, Molly. I'll pass things over to you. <laughs> thank you, Nathaniel. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, thank you everyone for being here on this Sunday afternoon joining us. Um, just an overview, I'm going to give a presentation for about 25 to 30 minutes. Um, and I'm then gonna do about a 15 minute walkthrough of the studio itself, where I can show you objects and work in progress from the presentation. Um, and then at the end, I wanna leave room for questions to talk through some things more specifically. Um, I do wanna say that I think of this as a reciprocal exchange. Uh, it's a gift for me to have the opportunity to discuss my work and the things that I'm thinking through and to be able to hear back from others about how they receive the work and what interests them uh, is really special and very important to me. Um, and so before I continue, I do wanna say that all the work I make here is influenced by place and situatedness. And so the land that Griffin is situated on and on which I'm currently working is the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, Musqueam and Stolo nations. I feel fortunate, grateful and humble to be raised on and to contribute to this environment. And lastly, before I begin with the slides, I really wanna thank the Griffin Art Projects uh, community for this amazing opportunity. Uh, Lisa, the curator, Jazz, uh, Nathaniel, Henning, and Brigitta Henning, who I was uh, able to meet yesterday. It's really um, uh, going through graduate school between 2019 and 2021 was challenging and destabilizing. 
Um, and in this quiet and pensive space in North Vancouver, I've been able to think through some themes and issues from these past years, um, things that I think are very pressing and urgent. Um, and it's really been uh, a remarkable shift for my practice. Um, and I do want to say it's wonderful to be paired with my studio mate Tantan, who is next door. Uh, they're making some remarkable work and they're going to be doing their artist talk at the end of November. And there is this image of artists working in isolation. And uh, it's so important to have colleagues around, to be able to talk through ideas, to have snacks, um, to just hang out and be able to uh, express your ideas and see them through another person's eyes. So having the space to share is also really important. And uh, so I'm going to start the slides now. So um, this presentation, which I'm just about to start, is meant as an introduction to my practice. Uh, and I lay out my framework for my materials and my concepts that are guiding my work um, for the past five years, but also particularly through this residency. Um, I'm only halfway through, as Nathaniel mentioned. So this is all work in progress. And I don't work in a sequential way. So I don't make one piece and then finish the next one, uh, but rather I produce a body of work all at once. Uh, and I really think through the materials that I'm using. Um, so I work more in a network rather than a linear teleo teleological way. Um, and in addition to this, my work is also extensively researched and I won't be going too much into the deep details and the thoughts behind each piece because we'd need uh, a few hours, but I am gonna provide uh, an overview and introduction to how I work and how I'm thinking about it. Uh, I also wanna say that I'm a 30 year old Caucasian woman with brown hair sitting in a white room with artworks behind me, which are painted with red and black and gray and some plexiglass and silicone mounted to the wall for those who might require a visual description in the audience. So what you see on the screen right now is a work on canvas. Uh, this work I made in 2017, and it's quite a big painting. It's 72 by 68 inches high. Um, and I wanted to start with this place of painting because the work that I'm gonna show isn't directly works with acrylic on canvas, um, but all of my practice comes from this place of painting and printmaking. So it is how I was trained uh, to think about representing space, uh, to think about composition and color. And while I'm making these material explorations, I'm always making paintings on the side as a way to think through these ideas. Um, so this is a work from a year ago. It's gonna be a year ago next week. Uh, this work was shown at Emily Carr. And these are, as you can see, a big jump from the painting on canvas that I just showed. Um, and I want to revisit the artist statement that Nathaniel mentioned. Uh, the thing that I'm interested in, in so far as working between the relationship of computation and social abstraction. So I want to say briefly that computation is any type of calculation that includes both arithmetic and non-arithmetical steps, and which follows a well-defined model. Uh, it's especially well-known discipline of computation and computer science. Um, so I refer to computation as a way to think about binary structures, as a way to think about systems theory, uh, as a way to think about computers, because I'm very interested in how these computational paradigms influence social and political structures today. And social abstraction is kind of a term that I came up with as a very large umbrella to think about um, these processes of how the self, um, society, community are informed and formed through um, different political, social, and technological organizations. So again, extremely broad. Um, but I took this idea from an uh, amazing curator called Maria Lind, who did an um, anthology about abstraction, where she separated it into formal, economic, and social forms of abstraction. And so I found that the kind of abstraction I'm thinking about um, is not just formal. I think it's very much based in things that are very current and happening today. So thinking about abstraction as something that occurs from computation and that influences social organization. So I'm gonna start actually talking about the work now that you see on screen. <laughs> Thank you for listening to all of this setup. Um, this body of work, uh, you can see there are five pieces of um, their paintings, uh, but they're very sculptural paintings. So they're made with acrylic sheets that are transparent, 
uh, silicone acrylic paint, laser engraved acrylic, string dried paint and fabric, uh, light and shadow. And this body of work is called one plus two. And this reference um, refers to what I've been thinking about in terms of the idea of analog and digital as these two distinct entities. And that analog was something that was very real and digital was something that was less real. And based on what I had been seeing, especially in the 2006 election uh, where Trump was elected and the um, Cambridge Analytica reveal, it seemed that what was happening in digital spaces were having severe consequences in analog ones. And so I wanted to create a body of work that explored how these two different logics in fact are very intertwined and intermingled. And so analog is kind of this, uh, everything is one kind of reality. So it's like one, it refers to oneness, whereas digital is based on binary, like I mentioned, it's ones and zeros. So it's two, it's based on two. So one plus two is a reference to this kind of analog and digital way of thinking. And so here's a side view. You can see that these are layered pieces of acrylic. Uh, there are colored acrylic and clear acrylic, uh, and they're very much placed in the space and responding to the architecture. Um, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but the doorbell just rang, Nathaniel, downstairs. Okay, thanks. I'll go pop over and check it out. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry about that, everyone. Um, so where was I? So this uh, this work refers to the doorbell just rang again. Um, uh, so so this work, <laughs> sorry. So this work is now thinking about um, very explicitly the idea of screens. Uh, I, very, I became very fascinated with the idea of a screen uh, because a screen is this, you know, and I mean LCD uh, computer screens, phone screens, um, personal computing devices. And they really fascinated me because they're this space where it's very political, but it's also very private. Um, it's digital, but it's also analog. Um, and so there's all of these um, opposites that seem to come together in this space. Um, and so I wanted to harness the idea of a painted screen because a painting is in fact a kind of screen in German, it's literally called a screen. Um, and I wanted to use this space to think about the kinds of abstractions that I was seeing in um, my research, which had a lot to do with the construction of screens, um, digital coding, uh, how these were all functioning. And so here you can see, I was looking at a lot of diagrams of how screens were made. Uh, there is the layering process. Um, there is the, hello. Um, there is the color that you can see coming through. Um, and here you can see a close up of this. So one thing that you'll notice is uh, the acrylic that is in the plexiglass is colored. And so I was using this as a way to reference uh, something called additive colors. And additive colors refers to using colors to make light. And so uh, when you add colors to light, the more colors you add, the lighter it will become. Whereas when you take away colors, it becomes a shadow. And you can see that from the image, you have yellow shadows and you have dark shadows. Um, the color palette also for this is uh, red, green, and blue. And this refers to um, the digital devices. Uh, they're activated by electrical charge, causing them to glow. And these elements are called subpixels. And so when you combine these colors of red, green, and blue, the desired hue is created in one pixel. Uh, and then the pixels are formed like tiny mosaics to make a, make a picture. And you can see clearly here, I'm referencing the pixel. Uh, I have squares, I have um, on the right-hand side, you can see the acrylic plexiglass has been cut out with a laser cutter. Um, and then these kind of really mechanized structures are then contrasted with these really open brushwork of thinking about painting and thinking about these singular gestures and these really physical moments. Um, to kind of make this piece. Uh, and here's some details. So on the left-hand side, you can see the fabric that's pushing through the hole and this kind of idea of the screen and coming through the screen, um, this flat surface becoming three-dimensional. And then on the right-hand side, you can see a better detail of the laser engraved acrylic. And so 
uh, the laser engraving is of course screens, but it's also referring to um, uh, the image that I took, which was of uh, iridescence. And so uh, iridescence is something that is quite fascinating to me because of the way it plays with light and the way it, that it will always change depending on your position and the way that it can't be photographed. And so I took iridescence and then brought it down to its uh, like the lowest amount of pixels that I could and then cut it out in plexiglass and then poured silicone into it. And I liked this idea of the silicone, the material, something that is the closest to flesh, something that is used in the place for prosthetic limbs. Um, this substance is starting to be formed through these mechanic thresholds. So it's again, this idea of a machine or some kind of computation informing and forming subjectivity, forming bodies, um, and uh, really um, kind of providing a sense of force. And here is again, another diagram that I was thinking about for these pieces. This refers to lenticular design. Uh, and a lenticular design is those cards that you go back and forth with and the images shift. So there's two images in one. So again, it was thinking about these opposites, this kind of dialectical structure, but having it become a synthesis and kind of complicating the way that we're thinking about these conceptual categories. Uh, and here's another one. And so the, the titles for these are all based on numbers. So this one is called 03, uh, kind of referring to code again, referring to uh, the way that images are stored. And you can see that they're mounted to the wall with bolts and nuts and they are made of four sheets of acrylic plexiglass with blue plexi. And then um, the painted marks are taken from the palette from the inside of a mouth. Um, so again, kind of referencing these inner forces of uh, bodily functioning. Um, and again, these pieces, I consider them to begin when they are um, inserted into the architecture. So I have a lot of pieces of acrylic, but the pieces really start and begin when I drill the holes into the walls and they become a part of the wall and the space itself. Uh, in addition to that, the lighting is very important and the shadows I actually consider a material with these pieces. And the light comes from the electrical sources of the building. So it's kind of involving the architecture in these pieces and involving space and movement. Here's a smaller one. So this one is about 10 inches by four inches across. And again, uh, bolts and nets mounted to the wall along with uh, silicone that is pressured and, and pushed between these two things of acrylic. Uh, and so again, I'm, I'm kind of playing with this idea of image compression and uh, tension. And this piece, I, can, I think it's really affective. It has a, quite an emotional response to it. And I really like the photo on the left because you can see that the colors are shining through the edges of the piece. So you have an image on the front, but then you also have this alternative way into the piece as through this kind of like diffused and abstracted way. And then this is the last one. This one is uh, two pieces of acrylic that are mounted together. And it has a piece of fabric uh, organza fabric, which is a very thin, uh, shiny fabric that runs between them. And then uh, painted marks as well as a dried piece of acrylic in the middle. And so that was that body of work. And I'm gonna move into this next one, which was done in May, 2021. And this is for my graduate thesis. So you can see that the last work was really uh, engaging with a language and a history of painting. Whereas this work is engaging more with installation and space and movement. And so on the right hand side, you can see that there are large sheets of organza, the same fabric that I just showed you, hanging and kind of acting as a wall and thinking about boundaries and borders within the space. So I liked the idea that there's a, I can create a wall and then I can create an opening and it changes the flow and the direction of people as they move through the space. And I wanted to um, think about this in terms of how screens were operating, how screens have the potential to indirectly influence and change the flow of people uh, moving across borders, uh, moving through uh, countries, across oceans, the flow of goods and services. Um, and then of course, uh, I'm referencing screens, but very indirectly. So there's a green screen paint on the wall. Uh, the organza fabric is actually doubled so it has a moray screen effect. 
Um, and then I have two of the same paintings on the other side. And so here, this exhibition was called Suture. And you can see that I've sewn together the pieces of organza fabric. And suture is actually a reference to a Lacanian idea of um, for any Lacanians out there, it's a combination of the imaginary and the symbolic realms. And so it's kind of joining these two ideas together, these two oppositions. Um, so again, I'm interested in uh, confusing these tensions um, and I, and I using the same colors of screens. So the blue, the red, the green, the yellow. And this piece is a piece of canvas that's been mounted into two pieces of glass and mounted on the wall. And you can see it's reflecting the green light from the wall. And this idea of reflection is something that comes up again and again in my work. Um, again, kind of in reference to a Lacanian mirror stage about the forming of self, the forming of subjectivity, um, and also the idea of a screen that is uh, reflecting something back to you, but also allowing you to see through something else. And this, what you see on the canvas is a cyanotype. So a cyanotype is a process, it's a printmaking process that's quite photographic. So it uses um, a solution that results in blue, a cyan color, hence cyanotype, that records the shadows of the thing that is left on top of it. And so I became very interested in recording transparency. Um, so I was taking a lot of transparent objects and trying to see if they had weight um, if there was some kind of way of verifying their existence, because the idea of immaterial technologies or the idea of um, things operating transparently through technology, uh, I find quite problematic. I think that that's an idea that has to be complicated. And so I was looking for these material interventions and a way and a visual language to think through those things. And this, this critique of transparency will come through as I show the later work. Um, and this is kind of the beginning of when I was thinking about that. This piece is called an assemblage of non-orientable objects. And um, you have four pieces of half inch thick plexiglass. Uh, you have two iPhones that have, well, they're silicone iPhones that have been cast. And you have, again, the piece of organza fabric that is squished between them. And on top, you have a glass sculpture and the sculpture is a Mobius strip. And this marks a point in my practice where I started to work a lot more sculpturally. So I moved away from working with abstraction and I started to think about the objects themselves and to reference them more explicitly. So there's a detail of the silicone iPhone that's been embedded with a fabric. So this fabric was, um, it, I screen printed fabric using um, black ink and an image that I took from a VR experience. So virtual reality. And something that struck me in the virtual reality was the like the immense grid that there was and the way that gravity was um, uh, kind of mimicked. And it was, it was present and there were shadows on the floor, but my own shadow wasn't there. Um, and so these are moments where I'm trying to take things from this virtual space and put them into the silicone pieces and like kind of bring weight back into this work. And this is the Mobius strip. So for those who don't know, just briefly, a Mobius strip is a, I'll show a picture. So a Mobius strip is a kind of object that um, it only has one surface. And so as you go around this piece, instead of going on a top and a bottom, you will circle around it, but you will just turn into a mirror image every time you circle around it. And this is an object that is called non-topological. Uh, non so topology, it's a branch of mathematics and it refers to surfaces and surfaces that have like a top and a bottom. So you can orient yourself. And I'm, I'm saying this very simply and broadly, but you can orient yourself to these different surfaces. Um, whereas in a Mobius strip, it's always one surface that you're looping around consistently and it, you can't orient yourself. And I was very intrigued with this concept in terms of thinking about how screens acted as a loop between digital and physical spaces. And every time a digital kind of entity came into an analog one, it kind of was the inverse or a mirror image. Um, and so uh, this refers to a branch of cybernetics. Um, cybernetics is basically the study of systems. And it's the idea that when, um, 
when there is a system, and this is used in a lot of uh, AI um, programming, when there's a system, the system will always move towards order. And so you'll always have a feedback loop that is consistently um, sending and receiving information and, and moving towards order. Um, and so I was interested in this, uh, in like pairing this kind of thought with iPhones and kind of thinking about the loop and thinking about reflection and thinking about how these spaces are so intimately intertwined and that there is an urgency to thinking about um, what happens in digital spaces as uh, just as important in what's happening in the physical ones. And that that binary is very flawed. Um, so here's an example of the 3D scan that I used to make the glass piece. So the glass piece is actually made in a digital environment and then printed. And you can see here's the mold, sorry, the, the pixel, it's very pixelated, but you can see the mold um, that was 3D printed with a digital printer. And then the glass was printed, was fired inside. And here's the other side of this installation. So more acrylic paintings. Um, you can see here, I was again, working more directly with forms. Uh, these silicone details are references to iPhone boxes. I was pouring silicone into these boxes and the plexiglass on top is a laser etching into the acrylic. And the etching is of um, an image, like a flattened image of a 3D scanned object. So instead of having this, um, the, the digital file as being a three-dimensional one, this was the flattened version of it. And so again, there's this theme of movement coming forth in my practice. Um, there's the theme of forms of imaging that inform perception and uh, photographic processes of scanning, of x-rays, of um, um, three-dimensional scanning. All these things are kind of coming through and I'm trying to reference them in an indirect way to talk about forms of visuality, which is a way to talk about um, you know, the kind of structures of power that are happening almost transparently and trying to give a, a, a kind of visual language to these things. Uh, and here's another, uh, I really love these diagrams. I love the layers and the kind of um, pointed marks that they all have. And I, I really bring these, this kind of scientific language, this mechanic language into the practice and into the work that I make. And so now we're jumping ahead to, um, this is actually just a month ago. Uh, this was uh, an installation of glass. And so these glass pieces were shown as part of the 2021 Lind Prize, which happened at the Polygon curated by Helga and Justin. Uh, and it was a great show. Uh, this work was uh, hanging in the space. So I'll show you the picture. Uh, in this image, the background, uh, works are taken out. Um, but so this was taking this idea of screens, uh, the importance of the, the materiality and glass and kind of using it um, in a more direct way. So I'm moving more and more into speaking um, more directly to these, these uh, electronic devices. And you can see um, this one's done in the shape of an iPhone. Um, this one's done in the shape of a laptop screen. And I'm just going to speak a little bit about the process of making these. Um, this is a glass piece that has an image of a decal, which is a, a printout of a ceramic ink. So the decal is applied to the glass and then it's fired to the glass. And then I layer. So again, I'm using this, this method of layering works. I layer the glass together and then I make a mold that the glass melts into. And so you can see in this one, the glass has been fully melted and the image kind of begins to abstract as it interferes and interacts with the material. And you can see on the left-hand side in the white glass, those are moments where the image that I was choosing, I engraved into the mold and then the glass melted and was molded and informed by its container. And so again, you can see this theme from my plexiglass works into now, of um, thresholds or um, uh, containers that form through images or form and inform forms of subjectivity. And so on these pieces as well, you can see that there are these engraved images like I was just talking about. 
And these are references to microscopic um, forms of seeing or modes of seeing. And this in particular is a microscopic image of an opal. And so I was again interested in how iridescence can be recorded as something that requires movement to see it. And I wanted to embed these uh, transparent images that can't be seen from the human eye into these works um, as a way to kind of, again, referencing forms of visuality that maybe go unseen, uh, referencing modes of scientific understanding um, in conjunction with showing images. And these are the images that you just saw in the glass. So on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, you can see on the left and on the right, um, they are scanned objects. And I have the objects here that I'll be showing on the screen afterwards. But what I really loved about these um, pieces is that they are moments where the scanner cannot see the object. So the object, because of its transparency, because of its surface, uh, because of its reflection, cannot be recorded through the scanner. And so I liked the idea that these images were actually showing a resistance to the camera and kind of providing a form of counter visuality to traditional ways of seeing. Uh, and here's an example of how the scanner works. So this is two pieces of acrylic with a small glass camera lens on top. And the white dots are what the scanner needs in order to see the motion of the objects. And this is how it appears in the scanner. So the scanner does not see the transparent glass. It can only see what is around it. And here's another one. On the right hand side, you can see the glass is slumped. So this is an iridescent glass that has been formed um, through objects that were placed below it. And then on the left hand side, you can see that the scanner can't see this object. It just glitches and it can't see it properly. And so here these images are embedded in the glass and these glass pieces themselves, um, as glass is something that's really difficult to control, uh, it's very finicky as a material. The temperature has to be exact and it can crack extremely easily. Um, a lot of these pieces actually show moments where the glass uh, did not do what it was supposed to. And so this whole body of work became about a moment of glitch and a moment of um, challenging uh, a form of control. So whether that's seeing, whether that's melting and informing, I wanted to have these objects that were abstracted uh, beyond what I could um, beyond what I could dictate them towards doing. So here's another example. Again, this one cracked and broke. Uh, you can see this from the other side, the air bubbles, uh, that same image of the flattened skin. And here's another view of the glass hanging. And I know we're almost at a half hour, so I'm going to wrap up here. And so this then takes us here to this beautiful studio that I'm in right now. So this is what it looks like when I just moved in. Uh, as you can see, there are photographic, um, there are, um, I was developing photo paper when I first arrived here at night, I was using the bathroom. And on the right-hand side, you can see there are canvases on the floor, along with um, some plexiglass and filters that I've put in the window. Uh, as an extension of playing with light uh, and thinking about my work responding to space and responding to the environment. And I just want to say as well that Griffin is situated in a North Vancouver area that's very um, industrial. And for me, this is a really, really inspiring place to be. I find a lot of um, ideas through walking through alleyways um, and through thinking about uh, materials as they circulate in industry. And so you can see here, this is an alleyway wall and this is a spray on a sidewalk. So this is an example of some of the photos that I take that kind of propel my work forward. Um, this is an image of some beams of wood that have been taken out and are rotting. Um, and the work that I'm making here at Griffin takes the idea that I was thinking about in the plexiglass works. So really looks at this idea of infrastructure um, and to think about how infrastructure is informed through material and immaterial spaces. Um, so thinking about digital and analog and moving into how we think about geomapping, geo uh, forms of gentrification, uh, the input, the, um, the installation of electronic lines and data centers. 
So what that means is I've, I've been looking in the archives of Vancouver and I wanted to make a, a local kind of specific work thinking about how uh, these processes of um, building are also processes of decaying and how um, environmentally the, the situation that we're in now requires us to think through um, different ways of using materials, of creating infrastructure. And so I find that when I look at all the building happening and I, I think about what's happening on the news, there is this tension of needing to stop constructing, but also um, requiring uh, livability in this really expensive city. Um, and so, you can see here, I've been walking through and thinking about wires as a form of infrastructure. And so this on the right hand side, you can see these electrical lines, which is just down the street from the studio. And on the left hand side, you can see that I'm experimenting with uh, tubing and wiring. And again, inserting it into the ceiling, into the infrastructure. And here you can see a final image of the beautiful light that comes through these windows uh, coming through the plexiglass and the light and the materials in the studio really interacting um, in a way that combines, again, this, this interest in material and immaterial forms. And so now I'm gonna take you all uh, through the studio. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, so I'm just gonna turn my laptop a little bit to this table. Is it okay you're in the frame? Sorry. <laughs> So I'm just going to go down here and try and get them out of the frame. Um, oh. <laughs> I don't mind, you can stay. So um, some of the works that I've been doing are uh, involving concrete. And so this is kind of the first time that I'm working with um, more industrial materials directly. And so again, it's thinking about um, forming the concrete through uh, plastic. So this is bubble wrap. Um, and this is the middle, so I'm thinking about inserting uh, acrylic pieces into this as a base and thinking about weight again. And um, these are examples of the iPhones that I showed. So you can see a little bit more the kind of materiality that there is, and it really references like the body and um, silica. So silicone is a basis, um, has a material base of silica, which is used in computer chips and computer programming. Here's an example of a glass piece that you can kind of see more in motion. So you can see the moray screen effect and the back of it. Um, and just to see the process before it melts, you can see that this is a glass piece where the image has been applied to the front. And then this one has applied in a double way. So this is what's called tact fuse. And then the next step for this would be to melt it. Um, this is an example of the Mobius strip that I showed. So you can see the details of how it was engraved, and then you can see the other side. And so for this talk, I'm really going into the materials and the process because it is a studio visit. And this is one of the things that I scanned. So you'll recognize this from the images. Um, this is what was scanned, and then you can see now how the scanner changed and picked that up. Um, and now I'm gonna do a little walk around to show some details. And so here you can see uh, the silicone pieces um, that are mounted to the wall. So these pieces are, they're kind of like an extension of painting for me where they were all poured into iPhone boxes and they're all embedded uh, with different fabrics and different objects. Uh, this is again, working with wiring and this is just a little experiment. These are all kind of sketches for me, I consider. Uh, so as I move through a body of work, I really experiment with the material a lot before I establish a finished thing. And so I'm very interested in using screen. And so you can see here that um, I'm pushing paint. So this is paint combined with drywall. Um, this is a really tough material to work with because it always um, is just a black screen. And so having that magical moment where you get to transform it uh, hasn't happened for me yet, but I'm still working towards it because I think there will be something interesting there. And then this is a painting in progress, uh, just started. So this is a rare vision. And then this is kind of uh, painting blocking the corner because I wanted to change the space that I was working in. And then here's a painting that I have been working on for a little while that's almost finished. And then on the floor behind me, you can see 
these four paintings on board. And so what you don't see is there's layers upon layers upon layers of color that are um, put on top of this wood. And a process that I wanna work with is sanding away. So again, thinking about this idea of decay, thinking about um, infrastructure and materials. And then these boards will uh, be mounted to the wall in a similar way in reference to construction. And then this is the other side of the studio that I don't show on the camera where the, all the mess occurs. And now I'm gonna come and sit back down and answer some questions. And I think we're at 35 minutes, so we should be good for a few questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Molly. Uh, that was great to contextualize things. I have to say, out of most artists, when I'm, I'm coming up and down from the studio, uh, the residency space quite frequently, and I swear every single time I'm coming up there, it's, it's dramatically shifted, which you can even tell from some of the images that you've taken in the past month. So great to have a little background info. Yeah. Um, I would like to remind everybody that if you do have any questions for Molly, you can pop them into the Q&A at the bottom of your toolbar there. Um, but I will get us going. Um, you did briefly start talking about some of the paintings in the background. Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of wondering what, if you could elaborate a little bit further on, on the process and, and what you might envision will happen with them in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, like I said, there's a lot of research behind every piece. And there is um, uh, there was this moment in uh, the history of psychology in the 1960s and 1970s uh, where this, actually earlier than that, but um, there's this idea of, um, behaviorism, which is essentially um, where uh, there is a psychology or a process established where uh, behavior can be conditioned. So you can condition someone's response. So everyone knows about Pavlov's dog, um, where you ring the bell before you feed the dog, the dog starts to salivate. So when the dog hears the bell, immediately salivates. So it's a similar kind of thing. And what B.F. Skinner was doing, uh, he was working a lot with pigeons. And he was giving them rewards or punishments. And he, so he did all these experiments where pigeons were playing ping pong. Um, and he was like basically training them to do things through reward and punishment. And so what I'm gonna do with these paintings is um, think about uh, those uh, chambers, those kind of like behaviorism chambers in which the pigeons were and try and engage with that environment uh, through the painted surface. Um, so that's kind of, those, that's the moment that I'm referencing in the paintings. But then as a process, I'm interested in uh, layering and then sanding. So more, it's going to be more about the eroding of an image rather than the building up of something. Um, so like playing with moments of revealing and then moments of concealing uh, as a conceptual strategy for the paintings. Thank you. Um, so we do have a few questions filing in. I'm seeing one in the chat here from Landon McKenzie. Um, what is the excuse for the mess as thinking and how do we weigh messy immediacy versus your weight of intellectual concerns? Hi, Landon. Uh, that's a fantastic question. Um, because I think, so Landon and I have had a few chats about this, but I do, have a process that's very research-based and I can get really stuck in thinking um, about uh, conceptual things, um, uh, these intellectual concerns about computation. Um, and then I also think about these uh, more immediate gestures and like ways of using materials that are more immediate, as she said. Um, but I don't know what is a good answer to that question because I think that uh, there is like a, a way of trusting the process for me where what I'm researching will come through in how I'm gathering the materials and then how I'm using them. And so I think that there is a messiness to it, but it is also a planned messiness. And I like the idea of things being a little bit unpolished, of always thinking about things being in formation rather than a finished work that is then placed on the wall. Um, and I also, there's always a moment in my practice where I let go. So as a printmaker, 
you know, you make the plate and then you put it in the acid and you kind of step back and let go. Uh, you put it through the press and then you let go. Um, when I paint, I start with a soak method onto the canvas. And so that's a moment where I just let go and then I come back to it and rearrange it. And so there is always, maybe it's not like messy and intellectual, but I think there is like rationality and um, a more of a feeling. So there's order and disorder at play. And I like uh, bringing those two languages into the work. And then of course you can see that letting go with the glass where I put the glass into the kiln and then let go and there was a fully melted process. And then I come back to the work afterwards. Um, so I think that was a way of talking around your question, Landon, but that's a, that's a good question that I'm gonna think about after this as well. And in that process of, of letting go, is there any ever, is there results that come that might be surprising that maybe inform or, or shift the way that you move forward in your work? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that the letting go could also be thought of as a process of collaborating with different materials and allowing the materials to speak for themselves. Uh, I think that's very important. I And I also think about um, I like what you said about how the studio is always shifting because I do think that um, the work makes itself. So I will manipulate things and change things, but then there is this dialogue between what happens with the work and how it can shift and change things moving forward. Yeah. Um, so there's a few, a few questions in the, in the Q and A. This one comes from Andrew Stauffer. Has creating work that explores screens, technology, digital analog, et cetera, change your perspective on humanity's relationship to technology. Also, is there a relevance to your use of Apple products over other phones and laptop brands? Mm, that is a great question. Hi, Andrew. Um, I'm gonna answer the second question first. Uh, I use Apple products for a number of reasons. The first one is that I was very intrigued by the curve of the design of these devices. And the curve is kind of this softening and this very intentional design of making things um, emotional. And by emotional, I mean, they're very, um, um, they're kind of kind. They don't have these like hard mechanized lines that are so common in the, kind of, bye, thank you, thanks for coming. Uh, sorry, um, you know, you have these, where was I? Yes, so Apple products, so the curve was something that was very interesting to me, um, but also Apple as this, um, this kind of, this company in which Steve Jobs became this really, enig like he was, um, you know, he was a very big personality. And he was very much credited with leading Apple. And so it kind of plays into this uh, mythology around like these individual heroes who create the, the, the future of tech. But I think with, in that case, you know, the iPhone was made by a number of different people, uh, different designers who built it over time. And so um, there's kind of uh, within this, there's an embedded critique of that, of like the, you know, the macho individualism uh, associated with technology. Um, and then also in reference to the history of affective computing and the design, which is so embedded in all the design we see today. Um, I hope that answered your question. Sorry for the interruption. Um, and then the first question, uh, I think I, Nathan, you might have to repeat it, but I think it was how my study of screens and, and computation influenced my view of humanity. Yeah, so it screens technology, the relationship of digital and analog, uh, change your perspective on humanity's relationship to technology. Yes, that's another fantastic question because um, I had really seen, before I started looking into this, I really saw tech as something that was, um, that was, you know, we refer to it as digital, but really uh, I became interested in, in an expanded idea of what technology is and uh, and more broadly, what tools are. And so, so you know, like um, you have these ideas of ready at hand. Um, and so to a certain extent, you can think of the printing press, you can think of the ballpoint pen, you can think of the wheel. These are all different forms of technology that have, that have all had very, um, 
impactful consequences in the society in which they were introduced. But I think that the thing that changes uh, today's computational paradigm is the speed at which it's developing and the ways in which um, large corporations are able to control individuals and the kind of surveillance that it enables. So that is really at the core of, of my interest with these things. And I think that's why the Apple products become so interesting in terms of what I just said. This very friendly rounded corner, this really like sleek design. Um, and it's you're kind of signing this contract into being more connected. And I do think that there are fantastic, like I'm not being, um, like I also should say that I study this stuff because I love it. You know, like I really came to this through, like I, was, I would be playing The Sims when I was younger. Uh, I did an exchange in Madrid and I, I started a long distance relationship when I was 15 and I um, really engaged with this person through a screen. So I come at this in a really personal way. Um, so there is like a deep love for what technology is able to do and the social changes that it can have. But I think at the same time, there's this other side that is uh, that might be quite sinister, um, and so it's it's. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your question, Andrew. I feel like that's a really long, long conversation that we could talk about for a while. Um, but I think I think I just I think I encapsulated the gist of it in that answer. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. I, I don't want to go on and on for too long. <laughs> it's a lot to unpack there for sure. Um, yeah. Thanks, Andrew. That's a great question. Um, this one comes from William Robson. Your work seems to use and question the use of many synthetic and industrial materials. What natural materials interest you as you explore materials, processes, and society? Okay, one second. I'm going to read this question. Oh, it's an interesting question, Will, because um, it's also like, what is a natural material? Uh, like, I think we think of natural materials in terms of, and plastic, of course, is considered synthetic. It doesn't decay. Uh, it's polymer. It's poisonous. You know, um, it's cheap. It's affordable. It's mass produced. Uh, we see it in garbage heaps. So it has this, uh, it, you know, but it comes from oil. And why is it that those things are less natural, I suppose, than wood? Uh, what is the hierarchy of materiality here? And I think that those are questions that I seek to look to kind of put together in the work that I make. Um, so I'm just going to reread the question because, uh, can you, sorry, one second, I'm going to go back. Yeah, I just, I just put it into the answered question if you put it at the very top of the q and I can reread it for if you like as well. Uh, no, that's okay. Um, what natural materials interest me as I explore materials process in society? Okay. Um, I used to work a lot with rust and I used to, so what I mean by that is I would use um, different found metal objects and I would keep them outside and wrap them in paper. And I, it was a way of kind of recording the process of decay, uh, of thinking about time. And so when I think about natural materials, I think about, I think about these processes of decay. And so at the moment, the materials that interest me the most are, um, concrete, wood, and metal. And I always have had a fascination with plastic. And again, it's this thing of um, being really repelled by it, but also being really fascinated and loving it. And so I recognize, um, I recognize that kind of uh, complicated position towards these materials. But, um, but the other thing is I'm working a lot with glass. And I think glass is a very ancient material. It's the material that formed lenses through which microscopes and telescopes were made. And so it allowed different modes of perceiving the world. And so I think that glass is something that I'm gonna be working with for a really long time. Uh, not just because of the reference to screens, but because of that potential of challenging vision and sight. Um, so yeah, those are the materials that I'm gonna be working towards for this residency. And I also wanna say that I am in conversation with uh, Nathaniel and I are in conversation with having an open studio at the end of the residency. So if any of you want to come by and see some of the work or like kind of experience the space, I welcome all of you to come uh, and chat further. 
Yeah, and we'll we'll hash out those details and um, we'll post them on our social media and in our newsletter and, and other various forms of outreach. So keep your eyes peeled for that. I also really like what you said about the hierarchy of materiality. That um, that got me thinking a little bit. I had to bring myself back. So um, we'll move on here. This is a question from Eileen Bamanipur. Your practice is fascinating and your talk. Are your works with transparency informing your work on canvas and more opaque material? If yes, how? Yeah, hi Eileen, thank you for the question. I think I was always using not directly transparency, but when I was working on canvas, I was still really interested in the, in the ghost trace, uh, in the shadow, in the imprint. You can kind of see that in the first image that I showed. So I was laying down a lot of um, cutout shapes and then I would spray paint around them. And so there are a lot of uh, ghost images that were left over. And not that that's directly speaking to transparency, but um, I think that there is a way that I was using a lot of thin layers and thin washes uh, that were coming through in the canvases. So, uh, but it wasn't dealing with, with kind of transparency as a substance, which is where I moved more towards in the glass works and the, um, and the plexiglass works. But this impulse towards transparency is not, it's not just about um, transparency as a as something that's seeing, it's also transparency as a, as a conceptual uh, idea coming from the enlightenment. Um, this idea of scientific reason and being transparent and absolute knowledge, uh, light and being illuminated, enlightened, um, and how the natural progress to, of that point to now is being, uh, kind of brought in through technology um, and how, you know, the promise of transparency through technology may not necessarily be a good thing. Um, I think that sometimes it's better not to know. And so, you know, transparency, I it, it comes through, but I also want to uh, establish it as something to be a little bit cautious of. And so the shadows, the reflection, um, and of course, uh, using transparent glass as a reference to uh, modernism and modern houses. Um, and kind of if anyone's read um, Barth's, it's thinking about the arcades in this moment of um, uh, shopping and capitalism and consumerism. And so I'm not sure if I'm, ask if I'm answering your question now, but I, it, it's a wonderful question. Um, so I, so on my canvas works, I'm thinking about transparency and opacity, but I'm also thinking about how those things interact with um, gesture and layering, but it always is in this framed image. And I'm interested in bringing transparency and opacity out of the frame to critique those things a little more fully. Um, I think that answers your question more directly. Um. I'll have a bit of a follow-up. I'll just remind people as well, if you do want to get your questions in, we'll be wrapping up momentarily here so we can get them in. We'll maybe have time for one or two more. Um, I just kind of want to piggyback on the last question and also um, kind of go back to what you were referring to both in speaking about glass and lenses, as well as kind of some of the processes that you use, like the cyanotype. Um, does photography and photographic process inform your work or, or do you see it as being um, kind of a primary influence for your work? And if so, how, how do you see that? Definitely, uh, thank you for the question. Um, photography is a very influential component of my work. And you can see in the glass pieces, I was using photography more directly. Um, but I think one of the things about the way that I'm working with materials, um, because a lot of my research has to do with new media. And typically when, when one encounters new media, it is working with screens, um, projections, video, and it's actually working with the tech. And I was more interested in taking these problems and applying it to a more material way of thinking, uh, because uh, again, I wanted to kind of think about and challenge the categories and the kind of like othering that happens with tech, like, oh, well, that's a tech problem and thinking about how like, you know, really like that's a, it's a very fundamental problem of today. Uh, the kind of questions that a lot of uh, the capacities of technology are asking such as CRISPR, such as artificial intelligence. Um, so the way that I'm thinking about um, 
photography is um, referencing processes of uh, seeing, so such as scanning, such as x-rays, such as microscopic imagery. Um, and you can see this in the way that I'm using shadows and in the way that I'm using light. Um, and in the way that I'm referencing the makeup of digital images and screens. And I also wanna say that the way that I'm using light uh, is, it's referencing a history of um, light artists working out of California, kind of in the 60s and 70s, but it's also, I'm, I'm interested in using light more because of the way that it, it is defined through screens. So this idea that a lot of the information, uh, the communication, um, the occurrences within screens happens with light. Like it's, it is light that is um, how people become, how people appear to you. Sorry, I'm stuttering. Um, so I'm thinking about using photographic processes, but outside of the photograph. So referencing processes. I'm interested in thinking about the screen, but without using screens. Excuse me, I'm thinking about um, the body uh, being informed and formed through power structures, but using it with materials, with light, with tools, with silicone. So I'm trying to use like these familiar uh, processes, but make them a little bit more unfamiliar um, so that they, they, um, they become a little bit new, I guess. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so there's no more questions, so maybe we'll just start wrapping things up here. Uh, before we do sign off today, I would just like to remind people, Molly mentioned it earlier, but our other artists in residence, Tan Tan Hong, will be doing a live from the studio event. That'll be on November 21st. It's also a Sunday at 1 p.m. Uh, so you're welcome to join us for that. The registration link is on our website, as well as a little more information about Tan Tan's practice and all of the other upcoming events at Griffin, including the Combine Art Fair in early December. Um, so yeah, with that, thank you so much, Molly, for the engaging conversation. And thank you to all of you who submitted questions, pushing the conversation forward. It was a lot of fun today. Yeah, and I want to say thank you again to everyone for joining us. And thanks to... Um, Griffin again for this great opportunity. And uh, I hope to see you all again, uh, the audience members. <laughs> Bye, have a nice weekend, everyone. Bye.